Okay, it's 11 in Italy. Let's wait for one minute, just one minute, for more people to join us. At the moment, there are 76 participants, as you see. Do you all hear me, right? Say yes, because I only see your face. <laughs> Mahmoud, do you hear me? Okay, good. I don't hear any one of you because I was so bad that I um, mute anyone. The fact is that sometimes there are some disturbs. It's enough one microphone and anyone uh, would be affected. So just forgive me. And uh, you will have some questions. If you will have, I hope that you will have some questions. Just write them in the group uh, Zoom group chat, okay? At the end of explanation, I will read the most interesting ones of those that I can answer to. The other ones, I will say they are not interesting and it's just because I don't have the answer. <laughs> and uh, I will reply to them, okay? So now participants are coming, 85, 86. Actually, the subscribers are uh, 250, but I don't, I don't expect anyone to come, I expect normally it's 50% uh, of the subscribers which are participating, by the way. Uh, it's already a good uh, result. Now it's 88, uh, one minute, let's leave one minute, they're still coming, they're joining us one by one, 90, okay. Actually, you've seen that we have predicted this uh, webinar to be 60 minutes long. Well, the last time it was made in Spanish and it was uh, 50 minutes long plus 10 of questions and answers. 92 participants, they are coming. Let's make them stabilize. Okay, 11, 0, 3, 92. We start. Okay, uh, when we say ATEX, we normally mean European AX certification, okay? So we are going to talk about the European classification. The European ATEX certification is valid in Europe and in many countries worldwide. For instance, it is accepted in Latin America, it is accepted in Africa, it is accepted in Middle East uh, and in uh, many Asian countries. Uh, there are some countries which have their own uh, um, local certification based on the same international norms. The root of all the norms is IEC. So there is also an, another kind of uh, EX certification called IEC-EX, which is valid in uh, more countries worldwide than ATEX. Okay? one could transform its ATEX certification into IEC by paying, uh, uh, of course, the certifications. Uh, Moawia, you don't hear me, but I guess that the others are hearing me because they confirmed. We have started and uh, sorry, but you must have some problem in your computer because uh, my microphone. Okay. Anyone confirm that it's hearing, but Moawia, you must fix something. Okay. Okay, thank you, Moawia. So um, now in uh, this webinar, there are people uh, coming from the whole world, uh, not from Spanish countries, Spanish speaking countries, just because it has already been made. Maybe some webinars are going to be made in some other languages like uh, Russian uh, or uh, Hungarian or Romanian or Turkish and so on thanks to my colleagues worldwide. By the way, let's start. The meaning of ATEX is, uh, uh, well, it's a name which comes from the French words uh, atmosphere explosive. And uh, it's talking about what happens and what to do in potentially explosive atmospheres. In Europe, there are two directives. Maybe you don't know what happens in Europe generally. Directives are like laws, European laws. 
they are then uh, transformed into local laws just by translating them in Italian, in Spanish, in French, and so on. And uh, uh, by the way, directives, since they are made by lawyers with some technicians uh, being consultants, they cannot be as precise and as detailed as the norms. They, they would need to make a directives which are like books, and it's impossible. By the way, the directives, which are the root of every norm which came, which uh, goes deeper into, into these matters, it's uh, two directives. One is for the manufacturers of equipment, people like Motive, and it says how to make a product comply with a certain risk, risk which are coming from the kind of a gas, kind of dust, and uh, the application of this. And another, which is uh, the requirements for the safety and health protection of workers potentially at risk. That is a directive which is saying, what's the risk where the people are working? And uh, what shall be done? How to classify it? Okay, so one is for the manufacturer. Another is for uh, those who install the equipment or may or um, use the equipment to protect their workers. So anything is based on uh, uh, this uh, clear uh, uh, aspect, which is uh, an environment which is uh, potentially explosive is characterized by the presence of oxygen. Otherwise, our workers would die because they need to breathe. The presence of a fuel, the fuel may be gas or dust, and we cannot avoid it. We cannot avoid fuel in a gas station. We cannot avoid uh, a dust uh, in a cereal, uh, in a flour making factory. But then there is something where uh, we can uh, have an influence, which is the heat or fire. Actually, we say heat just for approximation, but here we are meaning also sparkles, fire, heating, okay? And uh, we will uh, focus just on uh, our products. Uh, if uh, it's going to work my slide. So only motors, gearboxes, and drives. Here you see something strange, gearboxes. Gearboxes are not electrical products. Nevertheless, they need to be ATEC certified. In reality, also mechanical and non-electrical products must comply with ATEX. Uh, pumps, uh, uh, fans, uh, even the couplings. And why? Because even them are not perfect machines and they can heat. Even them, they have some plastic material that can have some anti-static charges. They can have some frictions. They can be the cause of a fire, okay? By the way, normally people say, okay, I never had an accident, so, I, I consider my gas or my dust, my environment, as non-potentially explosive. And uh, this is wrong. Why did they invent uh, directives and norms? They did it not for us, uh, because they were sadistic, but because uh, there were a lot of fires, a lot of explosions. And just because the risk was undervalued, there are a lot of dust and gases that one did not think or didn't want to think that they were risky. Okay, uh, so the examples are many. These are examples about gas. I will send you the webinar record after it, and uh, you will have a possibility to read it better. Probably we share also these uh, slides with you. These are only examples, by the way, of gases. And here you find a lot of things that sometimes one does not consider. For instance, uh, I had once the visit of a producer of refrigerators and he was telling me that ammonia was not explosive because never exploded before, not in his machines, but that was just luck. If you wanted to go on with luck, it was his choice. And uh, in every country, there are uh, some laws about this uh, risk assessment and uh, risk prevention. 
and this is dust. Dust is even more interesting because each of us have in mind uh, when we talk about explosion or a fire, we only have in mind the gas, but the dust is so many things. It's so many applications. It's about food and uh, wood and fibers. It's about metals and alloys, plastics, resins, rubbers of any kind. Agricultural product. You have farms in your country. Maybe you don't have petrol stations, but you have farms. You And then there is uh, coal and coal products and so on. Last week, I was making a webinar in Spanish, and from Latin America, they were telling me that uh, if the mine was not under underground, it was not risky. Actually, the most risky dust is the metal dust. The metal dust, even uh, aluminum, uh, iron, uh, or uh, titanium, cadmium, and many others. As we can see here, hmm? manganese, uh, thorium, uranium, vanadium, antimony, copper, bronze, and so on. They are all very risky. Okay, one can say it never happened anything before to me, but if they look around, Google now has everything, they will see that something happened also in their case. Maybe not to them, but it already happened. So the, the question is, should I do it? Uh, it's your choice. Uh, one can say here in my country, there are no controls and they control only in case of accident. If there is an accident, I will hide it. But the last uh, problem is, uh, and if it happens, you may probably say, okay, I had to think about it before. Anyway, these are only, again, examples of places where you have to consider an apex risk. And uh, these are macro fields. And uh, for instance, when I say drains and waste, there is uh, among you, no, not among you. It will be in uh, the Italian uh, Atex webinar. One producer of uh, biogas compressors. This is also Atex. Uh, there is another uh, which is making conveyors uh, for flour and sugar. This is also Atex, and they found it very healthy, very helpful that we also had an Atex uh, inverter. For them, it was a solution for them to avoid the Artex cabins, Artex cables, etc. By the way, you may be reluctant to use Artex for two reasons. One is that it's complicated. People always talk to you about Artex and you were not understanding how to order and what to use, etc. But this is going to be solved by this webinar if you are going to listen to me. Okay. Another problem is the cost. Normally, Artex products are very, very expensive. This, is also, this has also been solved by Motive because actually Artex motors and Artex gearboxes and Artex drives of Motive, they are just 30% more expensive than their non-Artex uh, brothers, okay? Anyway, these are examples of what happens if you don't consider it. Sometimes, not always, of course. These are all photos from Europe. Anyway, in Europe we have direct, the except one textile. All the others are photos from Europe. Okay. Um, actually, you may undervalue the problem. Maybe you are going to sell machines or install machine at a lower price. But you can also consider a marketing value of uh, being more uh, supportive and advising your client and make him select something which is safer. Here in this webinar, they are assisting not just distributors and installers of um, products which may or are um, Artex, but also users, okay? Okay, why did, it, did, did this happen in uh, Europe too? It happened because uh, they did not follow correctly Artex uh, uh, norms. Actually, those who made the norms were technicians. They classified each gas, each dust, almost each, and uh, each environment. And they told you what to do to avoid the ignition risk. I remember you. We cannot avoid oxygen in our environment because we would not die for fire, but we would die because we don't breathe. We cannot avoid gas or dust because we are walking with drains and waste. I hope not you and um, or in a mine or in a food storage or in textile and so we cannot avoid textile in textile industry 
But what we can avoid is the activators of a file, the verifier, the ignition of it, okay? And this is what they did when uh, they said, uh, classify your environment and choose what is proper to your environment. I remember you what I told you, they are not sadistic. They did not oblige you to buy a high protection when the risk is low. They told you, you have this risk, you need this. You don't need this, okay? But you need to know the norms. And uh, the classification is a way for us to understand how the risk is assessed and how to choose a product. Actually, these are three certifications of Moti. One is for the gearboxes. All Moti gearboxes are there. Warm gearboxes and helical gearboxes, inline, shaft mounted, and helical bevel. Another is about the motors, all the three phase motors, not the single phase motors. And another is the four way variable speed drives or variable frequency drive or inverter, as you want to call them. Okay. But in this, we find different classifications of our products and we need to understand them. When you understand how a classification is made, you understand how to classify also your environment and how to choose the right product for that environment, okay? We simplified your life, not just by this webinar, but also because inside each of our products, there are many classifications. And what does it mean? It means that in an ATEX product, we are uh, complying to a lot of ATEX environments, a lot of ATEX risks. I will tell you how. And we will focus on the motors, okay? On our motors, you find these uh, uh, writings, our ATEX motors, you find these writings. It's the same writings that you had to find in the certification, okay? And let's specify what a certification is. If the risk is low, classified category three, and we will tell you what is category three. Anyway, if the risk is low, there are three levels of risk, category three, two, one, okay? If the risk is low, category three, the certification is not mandatory. It's only mandatory that the manufacturer of the equipment declares that this product is conform to the requirements of a category three environment, okay? It's a declaration of a manufacturer. It cannot be called a certification. Some improperly call it auto certification, but it's a declaration of a manufacturer. It's not a third body which is certifying it, okay? But if you are in category two or category one, then you need an external certification body. Okay, these external certification bodies certify, guarantee that this equipment is conform to such requirements which are declared. And in case of ATEX, the certification bodies need to be notified by the uh, ministry. So they are not common certification body. Okay. Uh, let's start by, let's start to understand what does, what do this writing mean? I, I mean surface industry or surface equipment. If it was written only I, it was for underground. Underground means only mines. There are also mines which are in the surface or activities on mines which are in the surface and not underground. In that case, II, okay? What is I cannot be II. What is II cannot be I. <laughs> because they are classified in another way. In fact, if it is I and we are not there, mines underground, the categories are different. And uh, the ways to protect the device are different too. So we are here with a surface industry, industry, not only industry, I told you also, for instance, uh, agriculture is surface, okay? And here 
the surface has been divided into three categories one two and three so here we go to the next part of the nomenclature which is this two number we are category two but i remember you there are three categories three is the lowest risk two is higher one is even higher so if we comply with two we are also complying to three because the requirements for two are more restrictive than three three does not comply with two but two complies with two and three okay that's the idea so if they ask it for one we did not comply if it was one it complied with any category and now we will also specify what is one two or three okay so don't worry we will come to your questions by the way you see written 2g and 2d 2g is, 2g means it means that it is for category 2 gas but at the same time it has been certified also for category 2 dust some don't say category 2 or category 3 gas or dust they talk about zones and uh, it's like this two gas is zone one three gas is zone two two dust is zone 21 three dust is zone 22 okay so if i tell you that they need a motor category two gas it's like that they told you that they needed a motor zone one okay different words for the same matter so now you can understand what your clients are asking actually another way to say is what is written at the end of uh, this uh, nomenclature gb means uh, category two gas gc means category three gas or zone two and so on d for dust why did they write also these two letters is just to underline that uh, they work in a different way because of a different uh, uh, category okay high protection is for category two the highest risk okay the equipment remains safe in normal operation also when a false one single fault occurs and uh, um, GC or DC is increased safety. I mean, it's better than a normal product, but not as good as a high protection one. This scheme is uh, saying once again the same thing, okay? Category one means zone 20, and if it is a dust, or zone zero if it is gas. There is orange or red as you want, because we are not complying with it. But you will see in the next slides that category one is very rare. Okay, in 90% of the requests of your clients, you will see that our Atex product is there, is complying with it. You will understand it better with uh, the following examples. This is a petrol station, so we are talking about gas. And where the fuel, uh, the gas, is always there, that is category one or zone zero. Where the fuel is passing through and not permanently there, that, zo that is zone one, category two. Where you cannot smoke or switch on your uh, mobile phone, where you are and you are not holding the fuel in your hands, but you are near the fuel, that's category three. And that's normally where the worker is, okay? In fact, if you look at um, the pump, you may find the Artex uh, nameplate. And we, if it is there, you will see that it's 2G, category two gas, zone one, same uh, uh, way of thinking uh, with uh, dust. 
whether explosive, potentially explosive dust is there in the, inside the tank, it's zone 20, category one. Where the dust passes through, like on the conveyor or inside the pipes, it's zone 21, category two. And where the worker is, it's category three, okay, zone 22. So now you can understand why it's quite rare that they are going to ask you a motor for category one. Did you ever see a motor inside uh, the tank of your car, the tank of a gas station, a tank of explosive dust? They will not put it in, okay? And now let's try to understand another risk assessment. This C. This letter could also be A or B, okay? The gases and the dusts have been classified A, B, or C. Here we are not talking about categories. We are not talking about where is it? Is it inside the tank? Is it is on the conveyor or where? We are just talking about what kind, what properties does this gas or this dust have? The properties can be of two kinds. One is uh, how progressive is uh, the explosion or the burning of it. Another is uh, at what temperature does it have the ignition point? And that's what you see after the C. And we will talk about it in a few minutes. Okay, C is a higher risk than B or A. Therefore, if we made an equipment which is complying with C risk, we are also complying with B or A, okay? That's why we never ask to our clients, is it A, B or C? Because anyway, we are always complying with anything in that case. This is an example of gas, okay? Let's talk about hydrogen, for example. Hmm? This is C. Uh, physically, hydrogen has the highest risk, but the ignition temperature is T1. When does hydrogen become uh, explosive? At 450 degrees. We are T4. Do we comply with it? Yes, because T4 also means 135 degrees. So if our equipment is certified to not to go above 135 degrees, never, of course, it will never cause the ignition of T1, T2, or T3 as well, okay? So T4 is complying with whatever has been classified T1, T2, T3, or T4 but it is not complying with uh, those gases that have been classified T5 or T6. Those gases that have an ignition point lower than 135 degrees. Do you know a gas which has an ignition point lower than 135 degrees? I did not find it, <laughs> but they exist because I remember those who made the norms are not sadistic people. If they wrote down 100 or 85, it's because they know some rare gases that have such an ignition point, okay? So once again, by being T4, we are complying, I remember you, with 90% of the market. The 90% of the market is surface. It is category three or two, and it is uh, T4 or T3 or T2 or T1, okay? So here we are but we are not T5 or T6. If someone one day, strangely, is going to ask you for the motor to be T5 or T6, and in case that is not an ignorant and he's right, he made the proper classification, then you cannot supply our motors, okay? But better that you check that he's true, that his gas or dust is really T5 or T6 where to see it. 
uh, literature. There is not a norm which can have so many classifications. But in the literature, you can find if that dust or that gas is classified with an ignition point which is really below 135 degrees. Okay. Something is not in the literature. I mean, maybe you make a, your own resin. You have a chemical industry and you are mixing things in a strange way. So how to know what is the ignition point? You need a test laboratory. Okay. And then there is the dust. Dust has been divided into A, B, C, like gases, and uh, the C are called uh, conductive dusts. Then there is the non-conductive dust, which is B. And then there is A. As you see, to be suitable for uh, a C environment, you can only have a C equipment. But if you have a C equipment, you also comply with B and A environments, okay? So if you have a C, if you have metal dust, for instance, you can only have a, a motor with a C in the certification. But if you had some wood shavings, doesn't matter the letter, A, B, or C, they all work for that. I see that many of you are making questions. I, I, I like it. Um, I just tell you once again, I will answer at the end. And this is an example of dust. Okay, I told you T4 is 135 degrees, and we have written 135 degrees also for the dust, but they, they may be different because T4 is the measuring of the inner temperature of a motor, okay, where the gas can go into, while 135 degrees is the surface temperature of a motor, okay? That's also because it's IP65 and the dust cannot go in. Here we see some uh, ignition temperatures of uh, several uh, um, examples of dusts. You don't see anything which has a ignition temperature lower than 135 degrees. But I'm sure that there should be some dust that I didn't find <laughs> that have an ignition temperature lower than 135 degrees. Otherwise, we were not classifying lower temperatures for the, for the certification. But they are very rare. And I think that you will not, not face them in your life. Now let's explain what was there because we jumped it. What did that EB or TB mean? In reality, this is not risk assessment anymore. You can disconsider it when you order it to a motor maker. Your client can also disconsider it. And so why was it written? It was written because to comply with that categories, those categories, with the surface instead of mines, with A, B, C, with a certain temperature, you could have, you could adopt different techniques, all alternative each other. I want to underline it because here there is a frequent mistake onto which we are going to return. Sometimes people order the motors by telling something like, for example, EXD because we found it written on a motor. But they are not telling you, okay, but what group is it? A or B or C? What category? Is it dust? Is it gas? And so on. They are not telling you what you need to know. They are only telling you how, what they have read in the nameplate, which is, which is how that manufacturer have solved the risk problem. But they only have to take care about the risk. They don't have to take care about the techniques that the manufacturer has adopted. The techniques can be in containment technique, segregation technique, and prevention technique. One can say, I want to control the explosion inside the motor. 
an average can say, I want to avoid any source of explosion and therefore why to contain it. And these are all the techniques that one can use and that can lead to those two letters, okay? So when you say EXD, for example, you mean an enclosure which is containing the explosion. The explosion can occur. They did not care about uh, the inner temperature and how to prevent it and how to prevent the risk. They said, if it happens, it, I keep it inside, okay? We adopted another techniques recently. This is our new way. In past, we were EXD2, okay? The new techniques is uh, prevent the explosion. It's the so-called increased safety. And that is the techniques used for gas. In past, our world way, it was to make cast iron heavy and expensive and functionary motors, which were keeping the explosion inside. Now, if you look at the general look at, of our Atex motors, you find them that they can be in aluminum and they look like standard motors. There are some differences. For instance, we don't use plastics. We use special cable glands. In reality, we have to do many things on the winding, impregnation, impregnation winding data, and uh, several other things. Something it was already in our standard because our products, our motors were designed, designed not a long time ago not as long as many other motors in the market. And when we designed them, we had decided to, to adopt certain uh, features which were good for one day make our standard motor be transformed into Atex. For instance, uh, the um, so good looking uh, uh, terminal box is there to um, be shock proof. Shock proof is one of the tests which is made in Atex, okay? TB is uh, the way that we adopted to avoid risk for dust, uh, which is uh, dust proof. Of course, it's not enough to have uh, an IP65 degree motor to say it's Atex. One should avoid sparkles in any way. That means also control the painting, for instance. The painting coating thickness should not be higher than a certain number of mi microns. Uh, the anti-static charges which can be formed by the metal parts, they need to be avoided. Sorry, the plastic parts, they need to be avoided. Uh, the kind of a gable glands I told you, the surface temperature needs to be controlled even uh, when there is a, a, an alarm event. Um, the IP65 is not a normal IP65. It has also been subject to aging. So the gaskets, the oasis were tested uh, for uh, preserving their uh, protection after many years. And that's why they have they are in a different material. If you want to know something about what we did on our products to become Artex, you have to go into our website, download manual, and you can download the Artex addendum, addendum to the manuals. Okay. They specify what is different in Artex and they specify also some requirements not all because we don't want to disclose to anyone our know-how but a big part of it okay uh, so this is the situation in april 2020 of our products now we think that it's time for us to make our art text drives comply also with gas maybe the techniques that we will adopt is going to be the encapsulation. Because it's a pity. You put together a motor and a gearbox and uh, it remains in category two with gas and dust. But you put together also the inverter and you see that is not the gear motor plus inverter mounted on motorboard is not complying with gas anymore. So what we try to do by being a manufacturer of uh, 
motors, gearboxes and drives inside the same factory is to have a marketing currency. And uh, it's like for the delivery time in Motive, the delivery time of the motor is very short, but it's quite common to find short delivery uh, motors in the market. But it's not common to find short deliveries also for helical gearboxes, for instance. But we do have short delivery time also with them. It's a marketing strategy, which is, of course, affecting the design too. And that is also why uh, we made a table chart like this, resuming uh, where we are limited. If you put a power cooling onto an Artex category two motor, it becomes category three, because at the moment we do not have a category two power cooling. Of course, if you combine products, have a different uh, categories or groups uh, or temperature, what determines the whole classification is the lowest degree of each of these parts, okay? So for instance, here you see something black in gearboxes, the group, the gearboxes have been classified suitable for gases and dust of group A and B, but not for group C. So if you put together a gear motor with our gearboxes and our motors, the final classification becomes group B only, okay? Um, without having to remember this table chart, be aware that our configurator is supporting you in it, okay? We will talk about the configurator in the next webinar. Uh, recently, we have uh, adopted, because of uh, the reasons that I just told you, also, Artex category two gas and dust uh, encoders. So if you in the configurator choose an Artex motor and then you choose the encoder, it will put you the right encoder for that category. And recently we also adopted uh, uh, these uh, modular uh, uh, category two brakes uh, suitable for gas and dust. Since they are very expensive, we brake motors, we kept two kinds of brake motors, category three, which are only 30% more expensive than uh, non atex and category two, which has a different price because of the price of this EXD brake. So see, you can see that you can combine EXC with EXD because they are there for the same category of risk. Yeah, the end. This is, they're asking me, what does it matter in Italian? It means a scientist which uh, says goodbye to the explosion. And now we came to your questions, which are too many. Uh, Aaron Tang, break with ATEC certified? Yes. Flame proof with increased safety techniques and only increase safety. I don't know what this means. Ah, oh, no, sorry. I had to write the <laughs> to the beginning. Uh, are the T4 include also inside motor temperature? Yes, T4 is anywhere in our motors, gearboxes, and drives. T is the ignition temperature for the flammable material. Yes. What is the main difference between EXD and EXE? I explained it. And I will send to anyone the Artex webinar uh, um, record video. And uh, uh, EXD type brake motors, can we offer S4 duty? S4 is less than S1. We are certified for S1, therefore we comply with S2, S3, S4. What is the difference between EXD and IP65? Uh, I think IP65 is there for the dust. EXD is a classification for the gas. EIP65 is mandatory if you prevent dust explosion in our way. EXD is, uh, as I told you, flame proof enclosure which keeps the explosion inside, and that is a technique for gas. Can motor with S1 work replacing S1 or S2? Yes, because S1 is a higher duty than S2 or S3 or S4. So 
since our products are S1, we comply with all the other intermittent duties. Uh, here I have a long question. I have to read it. To get the requirements clarified with our customers, we are using a form. Bravo. We always ask our customer to fill the form. Bravo. So we know what we have to offer. Unfortunately, they don't like to sign this form in any cases. But I think we need the clear customer information about the existing zone and requirement to be able to offer correct equipment. Of course, it is not helpful to get nameplates from other installed equipment. I fully agree. Often uh, uh, they installed wrong uh, products and it's uh, useless to use a product which is too expensive or that is not safe for that environment. So the proper selection is not just a matter of risk. You can say to the customer who does not want to consider the risk, it's also a matter of money. Maybe that they're asking for something which is for a higher risk, or maybe they are asking something for gas and they are in dust. They are asking for something for a uh, temperature and uh, they don't need such a temperature and so on. David, I have to go. It's been a short pleasure. Okay, bye. You will see. Um, Aaron Tanger has asked it. For motive is explosion proof speed reducer. The design are mainly isolate possible ignition from mechanical abrasion. Uh, actually, there are uh, several requirements. I remember you, for instance, one which is very meaningful anti static charges. So, also the way it's painted. Um, we have to use Viton oils. Yes, we couldn't use mineral oil. And um, the requirements are more than you can think. I'm not going to tell you everything, but you can find what we did, some of part of what we did in the Artex addendum. Okay, of course, mechanical pro uh, products without electricity have less requirements than electrical products, and they are considered less risky. In fact, here I told you one thing that I need to correct. I told you that if it is for category two or one, they have to be certified always. This always was wrong. If it is category two, and it is only a mechanical product without electricity, it could also be declared conformed by the manufacturer. The manufacturer has to deposit the technical file in the ministry. That is something extra compared to the simple declaration of category three. But it was not mandatory to get an external certification body certification as we did. But we did it. Why did we do it? Why did we pay for it? Because we want our customer to feel safe and not to rely only on a manufacturer declaration. Amalia doesn't have sound, sorry. Uh, our own tank for multiple explosions. No, sorry, you are. Uh, mm, please give me permission to record um okay it was private anyway i think it has been recorded by at least two of you plus uh, uh, me now there are 160 106 participants not bad uh, okay the questions are finished what time is it now let's see if we complied with it oh we are perfect 50 minutes you surely were not bored by me and uh, well, this is something i like to say i know it's untrue and uh, i invite you to the next webinar which is about uh, a configurator because this is supportive with artex as well as it is supportive with any other matter consider the, expo, uh, the special executions and the customization of the products and uh, if you want to give a feedback it will be appreciated only if it is a positive uh, if it is negative keep it for you and now it's time to say bye
uh, to anyone. Thanks, 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 thanks to anyone of you too. Hope to see you, all of you, to the ATEX webinar about the configurator that you find in the website event. Better, I'm going to show you because I'm sharing the screen and it's, uh, it's uh, here. Well, actually, need to select English. Motive events. You go down, configurator, click on it, and register here. Do it because the configurator is quite attractive. It's a, it's a free tool that you can use, and it's like to play to get all the needed information. It's not as boring as me. It's not as boring as the catalogs, not as boring as the manuals. You just have to play with it, and you learn how to use it. It's quite user-friendly, but it contains all motive information, including ATEX. So if you are now afraid to make mistakes with ATEX, you can avoid them by using the configurator. Bye to anyone and sorry for having muted you. <laughs>